My name is Lindsay Belker, and I have the privilege of serving as pastor both at Christ Church United Methodist and First United Methodist Church, both in Santa Rosa, California. It's good to be with you in worship today. Today we'll be continuing our sermon series on crossing the divide, and we'll be looking especially at what it means to speak peace. As we enter into this time of worship, I invite you to focus on the peace that is, is all around you right now. To close your eyes, to become aware of God's presence. Creator God, you who are the source of all peace, we ask you to bless us in this time of worship to open our hearts to all of the ways you are speaking to and through and among us to fill us with your wisdom and your compassion that we would be transformed and in this time of worship we would grow more like Jesus, your Son. Amen. Present 
Good morning, everyone. Have you ever heard the phrase, and the little child will lead them? Or how about this one? Out of the mouths of babes come truth and wisdom. Well, today we have asked the children of First United Methodist Church and Christ Church of Santa Rosa to lead us in their thoughts on peace. Each child was encouraged to show their answers with a piece of art and when they were thinking about these two questions, what does peace mean to you? And when do you feel peaceful? Out of the mouths of babes come these offerings.
Today's scripture is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10, verses 5 through 14. Listen for God's Spirit speaking to the church. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out the demons. You received without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics or sandals or a staff for laborers deserve their food. Whatever town or village you enter, find out who it is. In it is worthy and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. If, but if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. This is the word of God for the people of God. Among the residents of Santa Rosa are the Peanuts Gang, created by Charles Schultz. We're familiar with Lucy's seeming disdain for Charlie Brown. Every year she pulls the football trick. Just as Charlie is about ready to kick the football, Lucy takes it away and Charlie Brown flies into the air before falling down and bruising his ego. Lucy finds it quite natural to call Charlie Brown a blockhead or dumb or weak. She delivers her insults with great ease, showing no emotion, and then moving on with whatever she was doing. When Charlie Brown fails at something, Lucy is quick to point it out. In one series, Lucy puts all of Charlie Brown's faults on a slideshow and illustrates them by category. His physical faults, his personality faults, his inherited faults, and his most damaging faults. Leaving Charlie Brown to feel miserable for days. Then Lucy has the audacity to send Charlie Brown a bill in the amount of $143 for her services. At the National Prayer Breakfast earlier this year, Arthur Brooks shared his understanding of contempt as the unsullied conviction of the worthlessness of another person. The unsullied conviction of the worthlessness of another. In so much of American society, we witness people treating one another as worthless, making our fights brutal, and leaving cooperation impossible. How can we move beyond the combustible tension that is dividing our nation? What is our role as followers of Christ in speaking to this growing divide? In today's scripture, Jesus is sending his 12 disciples out with authority to proclaim the good news of God's reign, to cure the sick, to raise the dead, to cleanse the lepers and cast out demons. But before this commissioning, Jesus seems to set up his own divide when he instructs them to go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Don't go near the Gentiles and don't walk into a Samaritan town, he says. We want to protest. Wait a minute, Jesus. You've taught us to love our neighbor. We assume that means all our neighbors. And you've taught us to love our enemies. So what's up here? 
Scholars consider this statement to be an editorial edition by the author of Matthew's Gospel, written later in the first century, long after Jesus had died. At the time of Jesus, there was not yet a mission to the Gentiles. Jesus was about transforming his own religion of Judaism, and so he started with his own people. After Jesus' resurrection, Matthew's Gospel proclaims the Great Commission to go to all the world and make disciples of all people. Jesus was not setting up a divide. The historical Jesus focused his mission primarily on the people of Israel. Later, the disciples extended that mission to the Gentiles. Jesus instructs his followers to travel lightly and to depend on the hospitality of others and the providence of God. Hospitality is a sacred obligation in the Mediterranean world. There is more to hospitality than meeting the physical and material needs of others. Hospitality is also a matter of opening one's heart and one's mind to make space to welcome and meet another human being. The initial message the disciples are to offer is a message of peace. In the Hebraic understanding of shalom or peace, wholeness is the joining together of opposites. Shalom brings together even people who disagree, so that each will listen deeply to the other side. It is often the people with whom we disagree who have the greatest gift for us, the potential for wholeness. Jesus encourages us to speak peace to those who offer hospitality and even to those who respond with hostility. Don't return a curse for a curse. Simply walk away and shake the dust off your sandals. Our scripture, as well as the principles of powerful, non-defensive communication, offer us some guidance for crossing the divide and offering hospitality to those with differing perspectives. First, Jesus starts where people are. He begins with his own people before his movement grows. Powerful, non-defensive communication also suggests that we meet the other person where they're at, not where we wish they would be. It begins with curiosity, which is an antidote to contempt. Contempt arises from a highly defensive place of a know-it-all superiority. It's like Lucy implying from her psychiatrist booth that she is qualified to point out all of Charlie Brown's faults and stomp all over him. In contrast, curiosity is an innocent desire to understand where the other person is coming from. It's a stance of gathering information. A sincere question asked with humility can be very disarming. An adversarial or arrogant question causes the other person's defenses to go up. Their brain turns off and they will either fight you or withdraw. The goal of curiosity is not to persuade someone to change their mind. It's to seek to understand where the other person is coming from. The best curiosity questions are formed by an open mind, free of a persuasive agenda. It requires listening to understand. Often when we are listening, we're really not paying attention to the other person. 
we are preparing our own response, even our defense to what's being said. Truly meeting a person where they are requires that we temporarily set aside our own agenda and engage with humility and openness. It involves offering a sincere space of hospitality in which we listen. Curiosity questions should be specific, but posed in a non-judgmental, non-argumentative way. It's a matter of probing for why they feel as they do. Curiosity is based in a genuine desire to listen to the experiences that have shaped another person. Here's a couple examples of curiosity questions. What do you see as some of the root causes driving immigration? When people say black lives matter, does it feel to you that they mean that other lives do not matter? Non-defensive questions can dissolve the walls between two people with opposing viewpoints. If people are genuinely curious, they can stimulate new insights for one another. A first step to crossing the divide is to meet people where they're at. Genuinely curious, seeking to understand where another person is coming from. Hospitality of the heart continues as we offer empathy. Marshall Rosenberg says that empathy is the respectful understanding of what others are experiencing. It's a matter of presence, of giving one's full attention to another's suffering. We listen for what people feel and need. We listen for feelings and needs, not for their agenda. Upon hearing another's story or perspective, we're often quick to jump in to give advice or reassurance or tell our own story, sometimes in an one-upmanship fashion. In these ways, we shift the attention to ourselves and even to our superior status. Empathy stays with the conversation partner. Erica Edelson says, empathy is the act of taking the other person's perspective, stepping into their shoes and trying to understand what they're really feeling. Empathy is not agreement or compromise. You can empathize with the feelings and experiences underlying someone's opinions without liking or agreeing with those opinions. Empathy deepens a relationship. It cultivates fertile ground for sharing our own perspective when the time is right. As this sermon series continues, we'll share ideas for presenting our position to others. But today we take our cues for approaching civil dialogue with someone who sees differently than we do. We meet them where they are. Unlike Lucy, who badgers Charlie Brown enumerating and illustrating his every fault, we prepare ourselves to listen with curiosity and genuinely seek to understand where they are coming from. Such listening leads to empathy and a respectful understanding of another's experience. It is offering hospitality of heart, providing a safe place in which people can share their hurt and longings, their pain and their dream. I invite you to think of someone with whom you've had differences of opinion. How do you feel about that person? If you're feeling contempt or anger, pray to cultivate a spirit of curiosity about that person, wondering where they are coming from, 
What makes them tick? If you have an opportunity to approach that person, pray for an open mind and an open heart, a heart of hospitality, that you might meet them where they are and listen deeply to understand. These personal interactions are a starting place to embolden our nation to conquer our crisis of contempt. In these difficult days, be gentle with yourselves, my friends, and be gentle with one another. Amen. Would you join with me in prayer? Creator God, God of all life, we praise you and we, we thank you. We praise you for the gifts of this creation and we, we thank you for the gifts of community, for the beauty around us. We confess to you that even as humble and grateful people, we know that all is not as it should be in the world. We continue to struggle sometimes, even as we seek to stay connected. During this time of isolation, we may find ourselves feeling alone we may forget to reach out to others. We get anxious, we're afraid. In those moments, we, we often don't love our neighbor as ourselves. For all of the ways we have been short-sighted, for all of the ways we have not shown up for difficult conversations or 
for necessary tasks, for all of the ways we have harmed ourselves and one another. We ask for your forgiveness. Lord, help us to lean upon your abundance. Help us to receive the grace that you have freely offered to us. Help us to extend that grace to one another. Continue to send your spirit and bless us. We ask you to send your spirit also upon all of those people and places and situations around the world that are so in need of your care. I ask you to send your, your spirit upon all those who, who sleep outside, all those who are refugees, both in our town and around the world. And we ask you to send your spirit upon members of our community those who are hospitalized and are unable to receive visitors, those who feel isolated from their everyday lives. I'm gonna ask you to send your spirit upon all those who are crying out for justice, upon those who continue to feel feel the egregious effects of systemic racism upon those who are, are finding it difficult to speak out now. Lord, send your spirit upon those demanding justice. Send us the courage to join our voices with theirs. I ask you to send your spirit upon all those who continue to serve upon our medical professionals, our janitors, our mail deliverers, those who work in grocery stores, those who are going back to work this week but perhaps are afraid. Lord, bless them and as they have blessed us. We ask you to send us wisdom. Show us the way to be the church in difficult times. And we ask you to send us courage. That we would live these days sharing your fierce love with the world. Send us the boldness to pray as your son, our brother, Jesus the Christ taught us. Our father and mother who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This light I light 
this fence I leap, this bone I knit, this seed I nurse, this rift I mend, this child I raise, this earth I tend. I joined this faith I state this truth I sign this is a small part in one small place of one heart's beat for one great peace it has been a joy to worship with you this day We wish a happy Father's Day to fathers, grandfathers, uncles, and those who offer fatherly love and mentoring to all of us. We invite you to connect with our congregations. Each of us has prayer time during the week, and we invite you to to join in that time of prayer and sharing with members of our congregations. Various small groups are offered by each local church. Pastor Lindsay is leading a study on the book, Me and White Supremacy, and she is starting a group for parents who wish to work on talking about anti-racism with their children and youth. Other small groups that are happening at First Church include a Bible study on Sunday afternoon at 1 o'clock with Norm Bryan. A Tuesday afternoon women's study with Kathy Bryan. A soul care group for spiritual formation on Tuesday evenings with me. And there are other opportunities listed on our websites. We invite your your participation in the life of our congregations. We also invite you to continue your spiritual stewardship of your gifts to your congregation. Our ministries continue in these and many other ways. And so your your giving helps us sustain the ministry of Christ in these days. My friends, life is short. We don't have much time to gladden the hearts of those with whom we travel. Let us be quick to love Let us make haste to be kind. And may the blessings of God, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you this day and always. Amen. Amen.